everyone. It's Plesky P from Melbourne, Australia. And let me tell you, it gives me the greatest pleasure to introduce to everybody Steve Binder coming in from the USA. And I've got to say, how are you today, Steve? I'm doing great, Plastic, and uh, it's just such a pleasure to be with you today. Now, let me tell you, Steve, with this big movie now that's come out from Baz Lorman, and the world's gone Elvis crazy, and to tell you the truth, I went to see the Elvis movie two times. During the week, I wanted to go and see the guy that portrayed Steve Binder in the movie, and it was fascinating. How great is it now that you're portrayed in an Elvis movie? To be honest, it's a little weird. <laughs> I'm usually behind the camera. And uh, I, I think he did a fantastic job, frankly. The only thing, uh, and I think Baz uh, took some literary license, <laughs> or the actor did, uh, I don't smoke. And I was shocked to <laughs> see that I was almost a chain smoker in the movie. But I think they wanted to say in the 60s, everybody was smoking around me. It's about time you got immortalized, and I'll tell you why. You've done such fantastic things in your life. For example, the Tammy Show is one of the greatest rock and roll concerts ever put to film in 64 that you did. And it had a Jane and Dean hosting, who were your friends. It had the Beach Boys, Chuck Berry, James Brown, Marvin Gaye, Jerry and the Pacemakers, Leslie Gore, Billy J. Kramer, the Rolling Stones, the Supremes. I mean, that was before its time. You are one of the greatest people to put that on film. That was a lot of luck because in those days, we didn't know any of them uh, would become, you know, super famous in their, in their futures. And I think all but one or two are today in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. So it was phenomenal that we got them all in one place at one time. And uh, let me ask you a question, Plastic. Who do you think was the biggest star at the time on the bill? I'm gonna go with the Rolling Stones. It was Leslie Gore. And you know what the great thing was? You're in your 20s and you did that. That's what's even more amazing. Yeah, I was at the time, I was directing a series with uh, an American comedian named Steve Allen. And I was with Steve for two years. We took a hiatus. And uh, luckily, the uh, producer of the Tammy show came to me and asked if I was free to, to do it. And uh, the timing was perfect. Talking about the Elvis, I've got to tell you, last year it was the Beatles with a Get Back special. But now, this current moment, Elvis is the biggest thing in the world. And I want everybody to go and buy your book. The Elvis 68 comeback, the story behind the special, because that is a big worldwide seller. And I want to thank you so much for signing my copy of the book. I'm a big fan, even before he started the movie uh, with Baz Luhrmann. And uh, we had lunch one afternoon when he was just formulating the ideas for the feature. And I was thrilled that finally, uh, you know, the movie wasn't a glossy, you know, make Elvis a perfect human being uh, or all the uh, characters that surround it, surrounded him during his lifetime. And, uh, you know, everything that Baz researched and said about Colonel Parker, uh, I'll back up. Uh, I couldn't agree with him more. And, and up until then, you know, all the biopics and what have you, sort of glorified the colonel as the greatest brain of you know personal management and so forth and so on. My, my personal opinion, when Elvis started out, he, he, the colonel was very valuable to his career, but that ended when I, I realized, uh, when I entered the, 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 the family, I guess I've called them, <laughs> is uh, that, you know, it, it, the colonel was, was uh, I describe him often as, as the wizard in the Wizard of Oz with Judy Garland, that uh, he was surrounded by a bunch of flashing colored light bulbs attached to nothing. <laughs> and he was, you know, he was play acting and, and faking it basically. And uh, it, it really worked because at that time in the, in the 1960s, most artists were managed by agencies, talent agencies, 
And the Colonel, I guess said, uh, I'm just gonna zero in on one artist and spend my 24 seven hours uh, a week concentrating on one artist. And he chose uh, Elvis. He never saw Elvis perform. He was uh, booking, I, I think a, a concert and uh, his story is fascinating from, from when he came to America, uh, you know, and he, he basically saw this kid on the bill, but he didn't look at him on stage. He looked at all the young girls screaming and, and squirming and jumping around in their seats. And he said, whoever is singing to those girls, I want to manage them. And uh, that's how I guess their relationship started. Now, with your book, I want to ask you, how long did it take you to write your fantastic book? To be honest with you, Plastic, I never had to research anything. I just sat down and wrote it. And uh, I uh, hardly uh, added anything or subtracted anything once I finished it. It was, it was basically a first draft of my memory of, of what I remembered about uh, all the incidents, doing the special. Uh, my relationship, meeting, my entire relationship with Elvis Presley uh, ran no more than about six months. I was not part of the entourage. I was not part of the Elvis Presley estate family. I was doing my own thing. And I had just concluded uh, doing a television special uh, that was kind of uh, became a news story around the world with Petula Clark, the English uh, lady. She only had one record hit at the time, Downtown, and, and uh, I was lucky enough to get Harry Belafonte uh, to do it. And uh, the story, uh, it was the first time in variety television in America, uh, in prime time, that a black person and a white person touched each other. And ironically, it was Petula who reached out and touched Harry's forearm and when all hell broke loose in the, in the client's booth, when the, the representative of the client uh, went crazy saying, we can't show that on American television. And uh, I shot the, the, practically the entire special like a movie. So I didn't have to worry about uh, entertaining an audience, a live audience in, in the studio. And I did multiple takes. When I first staged Elvis, I was trying to capture him as he really was. I didn't want to have him stand on a piece of tape on the floor saying, you have to stand here. And if you want to move, we'll put a piece of tape someplace else and you can stand there. Uh, I just felt he was like a, uh, an uncaged tiger. And I, and I said, Elvis, you do whatever you want to do once you're on that stage. And it was a little stage, like a boxing ring uh, without the ropes. And, uh, I'll be there. I'll follow you with my cameras. And, uh, you know, it, it took a lot of trust on his part. I was wondering all the way I was going through uh, the production in pre-production. Uh, I, I was wondering, when do I get the phone call from Colonel Parker that I'm fired? <laughs> and I was, you know, amazed that the call never came. And then I found out, Priscilla told me, uh, after Elvis had passed away, that when Elvis came home from his first meeting with me, he said, you know what, I don't care what the Colonel tells me to do or, or uh, whatever he has planned, I'm not listening to him. I'm listening to this guy, Binder. Uh, I just have a gut feeling that he, he, he knows what I want. And, uh, you know, and, and that's the reason I guess I never got fired because the Colonel had no power and we had so many confrontations that he lost each time. And I, it, it ended up at the very end because as everybody I think knows, the Colonel insisted and what he sold to NBC uh, was a Christmas special with 20 Christmas songs. Elvis would probably say hello and goodbye and that would be as much we hear about him and, and from him. And uh, I never wanted to do that kind of a show. So when I created the show with my writers, uh, Alan Bly and Chris Beard, uh, I was determined we were gonna do something special that it would, it would either fall flat on its face or it would bring him back and every door would be reopened to him that had been 
close because Elvis hadn't even performed in front of a live audience of any kind uh, or done any of that when he went through those 20 some, you know, what I would consider in most cases B movies and had spent a couple of years in the army. Uh, the first thing he asked me when I met him, he asked me, what do you think of my career? <laughs> and I just blurted out, which was the truth. I said, I think it's in the toilet. And he laughed and said, finally, somebody's, you know, speaking the truth to me. And I kind of acted as a Jiminy Cricket for Elvis, sitting on his shoulder, you know, guiding him. Uh, I didn't try to, to uh, what I wanted to do was unleash his raw talent from when I first heard about Elvis, when he first appeared on the Ed Sullivan show, I was not even in, in show business at the time. And uh, I was amused by him. I was a West Coast kid and uh, I was into West Coast acts like the Beach Boys and uh, Jan and Dean, you know, uh, the Turtles. And uh, I thought Elvis, Elvis was, was a gimmick uh, promoted by RCA Records and the Colonel. So I wasn't much interested in him or, or whatever. And as a matter of fact, when I got the phone call, uh, to see if I was interested in doing a television special with Elvis. I said only on one condition, if I do it, and that is I have to meet him one-on-one, -on -one. no colonel, no entourage. I just want to find out if we're compatible. All I knew is he was a kid born in the South of America in Tupelo, Mississippi, and then he moved obviously to Tennessee. I didn't know if we were even on the same wavelength. I mean, I was raised in a, a very liberal family. And, uh, you know, the last thing I wanted to do is surround myself with a bunch of rednecks. And uh, turned out, uh, you know, after that very first meeting, even though we were basically a few thousand miles away from each other in terms of our roots, we had a lot in common. And I liked him right off the bat. I mean, he was honest. He had a great sense of humor, you know, and uh, he was open. As a matter of fact, when, when I pitched him uh, the actual rundown of what we wanted to do, you know, I said, do you want to change anything? Do you want to throw something out and put something new in? Or, he said, no, no, I love it all. Let's just do it. It was that kind of relationship for the entire pre-production, production, and even post-production. He loved what we were doing. He only balked at one thing, and that is the, the heart and soul of the special, at least to me which was basically getting Elvis to believe in himself. I think he had lost his confidence. You know, he said to me in that first meeting, I'm not sure kids will even know me anymore or like me. I mean, it was a time of the British invasion, uh, the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, all these great acts were coming into America and they captured a whole new generation of, of kids. And he said, what will happen if the special bombs, if it doesn't work? I said, you'll still be known for, you know, your early work with Hound Dog and Blue Suede Shoes and all those songs. And there'll be a lot of people who, you know, liked your movies. And, and uh, so you'll always be remembered. I just think your career will probably be over. But if we succeed, if it's a hit, the world's open to you again. And then we talked about what he wanted to do. And he said, uh, I want to travel around the world and meet all my, my fans. He said, I've never been out of, outside of the Army. I've never been outside of the United States. By that time, I knew he was sort of trapped in this con, I guess the best you know, description of Colonel Parker for me was he was a con man and he was able to convince Elvis to do things that he wanted without any artistic you know, thought of, of the creative. It was strictly business. And uh, as a matter of fact, Elvis uh, and the Colonel separately told me they, they never socialized in their relationship. They never had dinner at each other's homes or it was strictly a business relationship. And unfortunately, I said to Elvis when he told me about wanting to meet all his fans around the world, et cetera, I said, I hear you, Elvis. And I said, but I'm not sure you're strong enough to stand up to, to Colonel Parker. Unfortunately, I was, you know, uh, proven, uh, you know, right in, in uh, evaluating where I, I thought his career, I, I've always said, I never thought he died of drugs. 
you know, I thought he died of boredom, just never doing what he wanted to do. At the end, he said, I never want to sing a song that I don't believe in, in the, the lyrics and the, and the, the, the hook to the music. Uh, most of his songs when he did movies were written by screenwriters. They weren't written by rock and roll uh, writers like Lieber and Stoller and so forth. As a matter of fact, Lieber and Stoller did give Elvis uh, two songs out of their repertoire. And uh, then they pulled back and told Colonel Parker they weren't giving him any more because they were, all the writers were being ripped off. Uh, the Colonel insisted that they sign away their, their publishing rights to their songs and uh, this whole history of writers who would have loved to have written for Elvis, but never did because of, of Parker. Working with Elvis, the hillbilly cat, as, as they knew him in the early days, and then you got to meet him. And what I'm saying is then you got this rapport with Elvis and he trusted you, as you said. Can you tell me a story that just you and Elvis know? Uh, we were working on stage at NBC. My stage manager said, the Colonel needs to see you and Elvis immediately in, in his office. Now the Colonel, he prided himself with being in the circus and the carny uh, specifically. Uh, we're always uh, carny performers, especially in, in Ringling Brothers, Barnum Bailey Circus, et cetera were basically freaks. They were, you know, the lady with a beard and just these acts that you had to almost close your eyes when you were looking at them uh, because they were basically pretty weird. Uh, a man who, who was a, a gorilla and would chase kids around the cage and so forth and so on. So what happened was we go into the Colonel's office and his office, he was offered all the luxurious Dean Martin type dressing rooms at NBC. But being the Colonel, he said, no, no, just clean out the broom closet next to the stage and buy children's furniture, and put it in there and I'll be happy. And then he had two Elvis's agents from William Morris agency. He had them dressed as uh, Southern uh, Civil War uh, soldiers standing guard in front of this little door <laughs> to the broom closet. And Elvis and I walk in there. I could tell the Colonel was angry. And he said, uh, boys, it's occurred to me that uh, Binder has no Christmas songs <laughs> in your show. And I sold NBC a Christmas show where he would wear a, a, like a Andy Williams or Perry Como sweater and uh, you're going a complete opposite direction. And Elvis wants a Christmas song in the show. Isn't that right, Elvis? And Elvis was standing next to me in front of this little desk with a colonel behind it. And uh, he mumbled something with his head bowed and he said, uh, yes, sir. And, and uh, so the colonel said, so it's settled. And he used to call me when we were in these these confrontations, he would call me Bindle. Uh, I don't know where he got that name from, but uh, that, that was his, his name for me when I knew he was upset with me. He said, uh, so Bindle, it's all settled. Uh, you're gonna put a Christmas song in the show. And I looked at Elvis and I said, Elvis, I, I didn't put any Christmas songs in the show because I didn't know you, you felt so strongly about that. And uh, Elvis didn't say anything. He just nodded his head again. And so I told the Colonel, I'll, I'll put a Christmas song in the show. It's not too late. We're still in production and we're still shooting. He said, okay, that's settled. I wanted a whole show of Christmas songs, but I'll settle for <laughs> one Christmas song and the closing will be a Christmas song. So we walk out of this little broom closet and we no sooner turn the corner and Elvis really hard jams me in the, in the ribs and using a uh, uh, four letter word <laughs> says, basically screw them. We don't, we don't need a Christmas song in the show. And so we went on into production, never said anything. And by the end, uh, when the Colonel finally told NBC, he wasn't going to allow them to even air the show unless he had his Christmas song in the show. 
thank goodness I kind of remembered during the improvisation acoustic sections that Elvis sang a couple of Christmas songs, one being Blue Christmas. And uh, I, I had almost forgotten about it. And so I brought it up and said, uh, I could pull uh, a Christmas song that Elvis did in the improv because we were out of production by that time. I, I, it was impossible to, to do a new song on a new set and so forth. And uh, so the NBC program director turned to the Colonel and said, uh, if Steve puts Blue Christmas into the show, will you allow us to air it? And the Colonel, who was an amateur hypnotist incidentally, he was, he was in that room leaning on his cane, staring at me with those steel blue eyes. And I think he was trying to hypnotize me. <laughs> I just got this eerie feeling. And uh, he sort of uh, finally decided he better do it because I'm not sure he had the power to kill the show anyway. And he said, okay, I'll accept it. I went down to the editing room and pulled out Blue Christmas from the improv. And there's Charlie, uh, his buddy from the army in Germany, who is now his, his best pal. And he's, he's screaming uh, while Elvis is singing Blue Christmas, sing it dirty, Elvis, sing it dirty. And in those days, you know, we didn't have uh, 64, 100 and some tracks when we, when we mic'd an orchestra uh, or even a, a, you know, a quartet like we had uh, doing the improv. And uh, so I, I had a really difficult time kind of tuning it out of the soundtrack of Charlie uh, uh, screaming, you know, for Elvis to sing Blue Christmas Dirty. And uh, so, but it saved the show or it saved the day. And, uh, you know, but it's typical, the Colonel, uh, Bob Finkel, who was the executive producer on the show, turned out to be, I didn't appreciate it at the time, but I sure have over the years, appreciated how great he was as my executive producer, keeping the Colonel out of Elvis and my hair when we were working. I never saw the Colonel on stage. I never had any confrontations with him on stage. It was always either in his office or my office or, or whatever. Bob played liars poker with the Colonel and entertained him for hours, lost a ton of money. Uh, I, I hope NBC reimbursed him for that. And, uh, and I'll tell you one thing he did, which was really, really uh, funny now, but it wasn't funny at the time. He gifted uh, Bob uh, Finkel with a case of Don Perriot champagne, which is very expensive champagne. So I'm not a drinker, so I wouldn't know the difference between the Seven Up and, and Champagne. So Bob was very appreciative, and he was having a dinner party at his home for some very important guests, and decided he was going to, you know, break it in at the dinner party. And uh, so he opened the case and he pulled out a bottle, uh, opened it, and it turned out to be Gatorade. <laughs> Every bottle was filled with Gatorade <laughs> and Bob was so upset. I can't even begin to tell you. And uh, it, it was typical of, of the Colonel, you know, thinking he could get through life just playing games and, and uh, manipulating important people. That was his real goal in life. And it was amazing to me to see how many uh, executives uh, were terrified of Colonel Parker. I acknowledged his importance when he launched Elvis and bought his contract from, uh, you know, Sun Records uh, and uh, took him over to RCA, uh, you know, but on false pretenses. Uh, Sam, uh, in an interview that, that I did with him later on, uh, said that he really released Elvis to RCA because he knew his company was small and he couldn't uh, deliver, you know, the stardom that Elvis deserved and so forth. The truth of the matter that, that uh, Sun Records, uh, based in, uh, in Memphis, uh, represented some of the most important country artists in the world. They, they had, you know, who were, who were just launching their careers in most cases, Jerry Lee Lewis, uh, Johnny Cash, 
I mean, a slew of really famous, and he was trying to save his company because he was running out of money. So the Elvis buyout from Sun to RCA was almost a necessity for Sam Phillips when he did it. And uh, at the time, I think he got the highest price ever paid to uh, sell an artist to another company. And with RCA's, you know, uh, power and, and uh, you know, their leverage with the press and everything else, he, uh, they really uh, delivered. Uh, but it was, was one of the greatest experiences of my life just to be there and, and uh, you know, not just uh, observe, but to be involved. I never, ever thought uh, the special, we'd be talking today 50 some years later when most television specials in America uh, aired one time and, and that was it. Never saw them again or anything. And now I look back at my career and, and uh, they're like, I don't know, at least eight DVDs from my past that are bestsellers now, uh, you know, uh, including uh, Petula and Harry Belafonte. And I did uh, Rolling Stone a magazine special with Steve Martin and, and a host of superstars. And, uh, you know, I'm thrilled that, that audiences today, and especially those that weren't even born during the Elvis period, uh, get to appreciate them and uh, see the kind of inventive work we did in those days. We didn't have all the bells and whistles and gadgets and what have you. In fact, I edited uh, the Elvis specials uh, starting with two inch videotape. And then if, if I wanted to edit, uh, which I did a lot, uh, I had to use a razor blade to physically cut the tape and then put the pieces together that I wanted to be together with acetate. And uh, it was a, a very tedious experience that took weeks of laborious work. You know, all that counts is the end result. Steve, I want to tell you, all the Elvis fans love you. You brought Elvis back from the movies to do live shows with the NBC special. A lot of people don't know that he actually directed a few episodes of Gilligan's Island. Being the Mosquitoes <laughs> one is the greatest one and the Ginger one. We love you for that. And Plastic EP and the world want to thank you for coming on the show. And we love you. And I want everyone to go out and buy your book, Elvis, 68 Comeback, the story behind the special. Thank you, Steve Binder. Thank you, Australia. I love you guys. <laughs>